Hey guys, welcome or welcome back. Tisha here for our first a chapter read of 50 years in polygamy. Let's begin. Chapter one, curtains wide open, the beginning. On our front porch, which also served as our laundry room, I climbed out of mom's galvanized tin tub, which was half full of cold, murky bath water and ring with Lao soap residue. The stiff yellow towel that had hung on our clothesline for a whole day felt scratchy around my five-year-old chubby body. Inside our three-bedroom basement house, photos and memorabilia concealed most of mom's pastel blue tricot blood spread. I wanted to sprawl out on the silky softness, but instead, I carefully sat on the corner of the bed as I stared at a five-by-seven picture of a younger version of her. I thought my heart would burst with pride. Mom, you look so pretty in this picture, I said. She quickly wiped her tears from her cheeks and her nose. What's the matter, Mom? Nothing. Then why are you crying? Oh, I don't know. It seems like I'm always crying. To me, she was beautiful, no matter what her age or whether her eyes glistened with tears of sadness or sparkled with joy. In her younger years, my mother, Vera Cook, was vivacious, slender, blue-eyed blonde. She loved to hang out with her friends, attend LDS church activities, swim, dance, and roller skate. But most of all, she loved to hike. Listening to her reminisce made me happy. I picture her wonderful adventures as if they would someday be mine. The 12-mile hike up the steep hill to the Black Cannon Dam was easy as pie. Mom told me years later, I used to pick apples, sell magazine subscriptions, and watch children to earn spending money. Then mom blushed as she brought her voice to a whisper, maybe so dad couldn't hear. It was the summer and I was 19 years old when I fell for Leslie Fenton. He was tall and handsome, she giggled. We'd been going together for quite some time when a real pretty girl came up and asked me if I was in love with him. You know what I told her? I was thinking, well, I guess I am in a way, but the words that suddenly shot right out of my mouth surprised me. No, I guess not. So you can have him. Mother sighed. I wonder who he married and where he's living now. Sometimes I wonder how different my life would be if I had stayed with him in the LDS church and not lived poor old marriage with your father. After a long pause, she said, well, you know what, Sophia? I really believe the Lord must have put those words in my mouth to keep me from marrying the wrong man. In mom's junior high year of high school, in mom's junior year of high school, her family moved from Emmett, Idaho to St. Anthony, Idaho, so they could be near relatives. Mom didn't want to leave her school and friends, so her parents gave her permission to move back to Emmett. There, she worked for her room and board and finished her senior year of high school. One Sunday, my mother attended church with her aunt and her sister, Alice. It just happened to be the LDS meeting house where her future husband was teaching the adult Sunday school class. When I saw your mom across the room, my heart stopped. I fell head over heels in love with the most beautiful woman on earth, dad often recounted years later. And each time he would boast about his gorgeous wife, mom would pipe in and Owen Alred was the most handsome young man I'd ever laid eyes on. And then they'd snuggle and laugh. I want you for more than just your looks, but I get the premise of this story. A few year, a few weeks after my parents' mating dance began, dad had to leave town to finish a logging contract. The three months he was gone seemed like an eternity to him. His only thoughts were to get back to Emmett where he could be near Vera, who was now his fiance. What mom didn't know about my dad and his family would change the course of our lives forever. Before long, he took her to meet most of his father's large polygamous family. My paternal grandmother, Mary Elvin Clark, had been sealed to Byron Harvey Alred for time and all eternity as his second plural wife. The sealing was performed by LDS Apostle Anthony W. Ivins. This wedding ceremony took place in Colonia Juarez, Chichico, Mexico. I know I'm butchering that. <laughs> I know I'm C-H-I-H, 
U-A-H-U-A, Mexico. See, I butchered it. On June 15, 1903, 13 years after LDS Church 1890 Manifesto, a highly respected man, Byron Harvey Alred, was known for his skills, wisdom, and integrity. My grandfather held many important positions in Idaho during his lifetime. Beginning at age 22, he served two years as a state legislator. He was a member of Idaho's Council of the Defense during World War I and a state director of the U.S. Boys Working Reserve. Grandpa served as Speaker of Idaho House of Representatives in 1916 and a state director of the family market in 1917. He aspired to run for U.S. Congress in 1918, but his LDS stake president urged him not to, saying Byron's religious pursuits would not be an exemplary representation of the LDS church's views. In one of mom's recollections, she told me, your grandfather father already encouraged each one of his children to fast and pray to gain their own testimonies as to whether they should remain in the LDS church or whether they should live plural marriage. When we were first dating, your father wasn't sure of his own testimony, so he was quite reluctant to talk to me about his parents' religious beliefs and the lifestyle his father and some of his brothers and sisters were secretly living. My mother said after she met Owen's parents, his brother Rulin and his three wives and some of the other siblings, she came to love and trust them. She felt they were honorable, faithful people. All of them accepted her as well. She said they immediately started treating her as if she was already a member of the family. And you know, Sophia, mom continued, nothing about their polygamous lifestyle was repulsive or offensive to me. From the very beginning, I had no prejudices to overcome. I felt like I finally belonged. As months went by, Rulin and Byron spent many long hours preaching the importance of living polygamy. They answered questions from any and all prospective candidates, including my parents, and influenced many potential converts with their powerful personal testimonies. They also delivered compelling ser sermons about an alleged eight-hour meeting which became the theological basis for many fundamentalists to continue living polygamy after the manifesto. Concerning this supposed meeting, Grandpa Alred recorded in his book, A Leaf in Review, LDS President John Taylor disclosed to 14 men and women who were present, the Lord and Joseph Smith had visited him the previous night and directed him concerning his priesthood duties. During the meeting, Taylor ordained and set apart five men to perpetuate the fullness of gospel, the gospel outside of the mainstream LDS church. My father proposed to my mother just after her 21st birthday in February 1935. Their marriage was so minimized in the LDS temple in Logan, Utah. Lucky for them, their local church leaders didn't question them about their adherence to the laws prohibiting polygamy. My parents were extremely grateful to fully participate in the LDS temple ceremonies. Afterward, they bought a wedding ring and spent the night in a hotel in Logan. While we were honeymooning, mom told me, your dad's brothers moved our things into a tiny shed they fixed up as a bedroom close to grandmother Alred's house. The first night we got back, just after we turned out the lights, dad's co-workers from the sawmill started making a terrible racket outside. They began yelling and rattling tin cans. Minutes later, they crashed through the door and the kitchen window. Get dressed and come out peacefully or we'll take you to the top of Freeze Mountain and make you walk home barefoot, they yelled. What? Back then, all the folks in Emmett gathered in town on Saturday evenings to dance and visit with one another. When someone got married, they would shiver them. I know I'm saying that wrong. S-H-I-V-A-R-E-E. -E. They try to separate the bride from the groom as a prank. So that night, right there in front of everyone, the guys unloaded a wheelbarrow, lifted me into it, and told Owen to push it to the end of the town and back. He pushed it all right. Mom chuckled. Your dad ran so fast, no one could keep up with him. He kept going until he ran the two of us right back home. Mother said she felt supremely happy to be cared to be caring for her beloved husband while their testimonies of plural marriage continue to grow. But most of all, she looked forward to the birth of her first child. Chapter two, Mom's Devils, 1937 to 1946. 
Grandfather Alred died in January 1937, 15 years before my birth. My parents were in St. Anthony visiting my mother's parents when they received a letter from Grandpa asking them to rush back to Emmett so he could see them and his six-month-old grandson one last time. They were heartbroken when they found out they were too late. Oh, man. The day before Grandpa died, he told my grandmother, Mary Evelyn, I will be going home in a few days. I'm going to die. Whatever do you mean, Harvey? Grandma laughed nervously. You're feeling better now than you have in a long while. Can't you understand, Evelyn? It's time for me to go. There is something that happens. I know it happened with my great-grandmother before she passed, where she was telling different family members that she was about to go, and she was ready to go. She was ready to go home. She was ready to be with the Lord. Like These were the things that she was saying, even though she was doing good. Now, there were some things that were going on that we didn't know about. Like We didn't know that in her you know last days her eyesight started to be affected until towards the end but she just knew and i feel like something happens where sometimes you just know my father is coming for me tonight then grandpa gamely chased grandma around the kitchen pretending to swat her with his rolled up newspaper grandpa died peacefully in the middle of the night what i say it's just something sometimes people know the same month Grandpa Alred died, my mother lost her two-and-a-half-year-old sister, Ruthie. She had a high fever and was convulsing. Mom's parents searched all day to find a doctor in one of the small towns in, around Emmett, but were unable to find one. Ruthie died in my grandmother Cook's arms. To add to my mom's stress, she miscarried a few months later when the doctor gave her morphine for the pain. She had a bad reaction to it. Before she fell asleep, her body began to shake and quiver. Mom's aunt knew something was wrong when she couldn't wake her nearly six hours later. Wow. She pounded on my mother's chest and poured water on her face, trying to revive her. Mom finally regained consciousness. Her first horrific reaction to the morphine was passed off by the country doctor as bad luck. After those three ordeals, mom was extremely grateful to regain her health and take her first trip from Idaho to Salt Lake City with her mother-in-law, Mary Evelyn, as a lasting testimony to her children. My mother delivered the rundown in her journal. For nearly a week, I had a wonderful time renewing old acquaintances, meeting new converts, and attending religious meetings with them. We toured Temple Square and enjoyed an organ recital in the tabernacle. Another one of the highlights of my trips was when Owen's sister, Beth, her husband, and his other two wives took Mother Mary Evelyn and me to see Joseph Mercer. That day, he related to us his personal testimony of the eight-hour meeting. The next day, when we went back to see Brother Mercer again, he gave each of us a blessing when he laid his hands on my head to give me the blessing, I could feel the spirit of the Lord permeate my whole being. Brother Muser told me of the things that would happen in the future. He said, God expected much of me and I should live the law of Sarah by giving Owen's wives as Sarah in the Bible had given Hagar to her husband for the purpose of bearing children. Brother Muser told me to support my husband in righteousness, and though I may go through many trials and tribulations, God would not have given me more trials than I can endure. He said, if I would live up to these things, I'd have grand blessings and rewards in heaven as he spoke. I know he had been inspired and was a true prophet of God. Ugh. The following April, when mom was in labor with my sister, Lucinda, another doctor gave her a dose of morphine. This time, she nearly died. Gracious. If you saw that the lady had trouble from morphine the first time, why would you go and then give it to her again? It was decided she was allergic to the drug. A uh, duh. And if it were ever administered to her again, she would not survive. From approximately 1938 through 1941, polygamous meetings were held in various homes throughout Idaho, the Salt Lake Valley, and in the squalor of Short Creek, Arizona, now known as Colorado, Colorado City. My parents wanted to move to Salt Lake so they could be closer to their loved ones and larger community of believers. Early one morning in January 1942, mom decided to ask God for direction concerning their dreams of moving. Mother told me she poured her heart out to God and he gave her a clear answer. 
You will move to Salt Lake City where you will get to see your sister Alice again. By the end of March, my parents and their three children, Don, Lucinda, and Francine, had moved from Emmett, Idaho to Salt Lake City, Utah, where they set up camp on the back lawn of Uncle Rulon's large tract of, pro tract of property. Mom recalled Owen commenced to revamp Rulon's huge granary into a nice, big, three bedroom home for us. Meanwhile, I washed all our clothes outside and enjoyed living in the tent, but only on good weather days, she added. There were two ponds, two flowering artesian wells, and an outside privy on, privy on the property. I was so happy to be there. I would sing and dance, but it was near winter before we were able to move into our new house. During this time, dad fell in love with one of mom's closest and dearest friends. Why is they always falling in love with the friends? Why they can't find somebody else? Why is it always the friend or the sister or the cousin? It's okay. <laughs> I'm about to go on a tangent. Because mom had gained a testimony that plural marriage was necessary for a person to attain the celestial kingdom in afterlife, she was eager to follow those religious dictates and encouraged dad to court her friend Alice. Alice spent days at a time with my mother, reading, sewing, cooking, and laughing. While the three of them waited for Alice to get a little older, how young was she? Mom tried to emotionally prepare herself to enter into celestial marriage. My dad was also courting a young woman named Eleanor. Okay, so how many people is he courting? She and Alice had also become very good friends. Since Eleanor was older than Alice, it was decided she would be dad's second wife. Well, there goes that answer. While Alice would plan her wedding for the following June. Just one month before my brother Luke was born, mother's desire to live the law of Sarah came to fruition. In May 1943, my 30-year-old mother placed 19-year-old Eleanor's right hand into her husband's right hand to symbolize her willingness to give him another wife. Goodness gracious. Y'all, I'm a little yucked out. <laughs> when I asked my mom what happened to Alice, why she never de married dad. Mom said, Alice came to help me when Luke was born and we spent a few more hours together. But for some crazy reason, she just up and disappeared. She was smart. The first year after your dad married Eleanor, things went quite well, mom told me. Oh, some things were unfair, she tensed up. But the next few years became my trials from hell. By then, dad had nearly completed the remodeling of the granary into a three bedroom home. Mom's four children slept in a small bedroom adjacent to her larger one. At the opposite end was Eleanor's room. While dad took a turn sleeping with his young wife, mom often found herself in turmoil as the sounds carried through the thin walls. So you can't be quiet? Why are you doing what you're doing? Ain't no way. For all of that, you might as well be in the same room. And I'm not trying to be gross, but if you're going to be loud to where I can hear you, where you can't mute your sounds. <sighs> mm. Mm. As my father turned his attentions from his first love, my mother to Eleanor, his young, dark haired beauty, he began to demonstrate a marked inability to calm and soothe mom's anguish. In addition, mom believed the devil and his imps on whom she blamed her suppressed jealousy as well as her feelings of inadequacy and depression were attacking her soul and they would surely be the cause of her demise. Aunt Eleanor, on the other hand, was a, was a light in the dark to dad. She was happy, attractive, energetic, and strong will. Her concern was not for mother or mother's children. After all, she felt they had enjoyed my father's undivided time and attention for seven years, and now it was her turn. See, that's problematic in itself. You come along and now you supposed to get special treatment. No, you don't get special treatment, but this is what happens. This is the, the other side of things. She was busy plotting 
how to gain all of dad's love and attention for herself and manipulating him into believing her objectives were for the greater good of the entire family. Other women living on Uncle Rulon's property became concerned as they observed the unfair situation. They advised mom to stick up for herself. They told her that to let Eleanor have her way all the time wasn't good for Eleanor's salvation either. It was never a part of my mother's nature to manipulate or coerce others. Neither did she have the appropriate skills to assertively defend herself. Therefore, her attempts to make things equal and fair ultimately failed. In fact, the more she tried to express her needs and desires, the more defensive Eleanor became and the more determined she was to have her own way. Despite similar trials among other families living plural marriage, the All Red com Commune was thriving and expanding. Large homes were built on Uncle Rulon's property or older homes refurbished for more close relatives. Over the next few months, Dad, Mom, Eleanor, and their children painted their house, planted a garden, installed appliances, and added an indoor bathroom. In the spring of 1944, my grandmother, El Evelyn, moved into Uncle Rulon's big house to be closer to her sons and grandchildren. Uncle Marvin's, Uncle Rulon's, and Dad's families were enjoying each other's company with a sense of peace, good fortune, and unity with no idea their little dream would, world would soon be turned upside down. On March 7, 1944, there was a widespread raid on polygamous homes across Salt Lake Valley in Short Creek, Arizona. These days, I call them attempted rescues. As government officials knew, there were underage marriages, abuses, and other crimes taking place. It's funny how this story is told in different ways, but here she is calling it what it was and explaining that it's not just that we did this because you were polygamous, it's because there were some other things going on along with the polygamy. Around 8.30 in the morning, one of my uncle's wives rushed over to dad's house to tell them the police had broken into Rulon's home and confiscated everything, personal property, books, papers, diaries, records, and anything else they wanted. The first day, Uncle Rulon and two of his wives were arrested. The following day, officers returned to arrest three more of his wives. Fifteen men from across town, one of whom would become my father-in-law, were also jailed. In early May, the men were indicted and sent to prison for unlawful unlawful cohabitation. The women were sent home to raise their children. Much of the correspondence between family members was in code, with changed names, dates, and addresses to cover information that would surely implicate them further. Articles expounding on the constitutional rights and religious freedom hit a few major magazines. Several happy, contended-looking polygamous families appeared in full-page photos along with stories and testimonies of fundamentalist believers. According to my parents and relatives, stinging criticism came primarily from outside of Utah by non-Mormons who felt LDS church leaders and members had turned their backs on the very people who were faithfully living the laws their prophet Joseph Smith had ordained. On April 7th, 1944, the cover of International Events Magazine, the world's news and pictures, highlighted my future father-in-law with his five wives gathered around a piano. The photo caption read, mate and five wives in close harmony. Little did the world know of the real events and the unrest in that united, and she has it in quotes, family. Uncle Rulon described his prison experiences in his journals. The warden told Joseph Muser that the church leaders and the authorities were anxious to make conscious concessions that would end this national and state issue. As parole dates were to be set, Muser counseled his brethren to comply with the state request, asking them to sign a document renouncing their beliefs and pledge to refrain from living with their plural wives. Joseph asked them to do and say whatever was necessary to get them back with their wives and children again. With their fervent beliefs, God's law were foremost and above the laws of the land. Most of the men refused to follow Joseph's advice, concessions, and sign a decree that seemed contradictory to their beliefs. They did not want to make an agreement with death and hell as they considered this new manifesto to be. Uncle Rulon told us that Joseph Muser instructed his brethren to fast and pray about their misgivings. 
That evening, he and Joseph Muser said they had similar dreams in which the Lord instructed them to sign the document. They believed God would not hold them accountable for this kind of deceit. Rather, he had opened the way for them to return to their wives, children, and religion. They were certain that to sign a document that required them to lie about their beliefs and future intentions was no more binding to them than the manifesto had been. It would be nothing more than a political agreement with the world. My future father-in-law and five other men refused to sign the agreement and chose to carry out their prison terms. It was a letter. It was later rumored, rumored that these men accused Uncle Rulon and the other eight men who accepted early releases of making damn, damnable. Okay. Releases of making as damnable of a choice as Wilford Woodruff had done in signing the manifesto. After that ordeal, many things would never again be the same among the Council of Friends. Neighbors, merchants, LDS church leaders, and government officials in the Utah uh, hopped, oh, hoped polygamous activity would eventually dissolve and go away. But it was not that simple. The arrest of the 15 men led fundamentalists to become even more tenacious in their convictions, beliefs, and secrecy. Then and now, hardships and trials are viewed as God's test of his, of his choice people to see if they will remain faithful and endure to the end. Whenever polygamy was publicized, our fundamentalists noted an influx of converts, proof they felt God was in fact upholding his cause. Those cases serve to encourage fundamentalist Mormons to shoulder up to their responsibility to keep building the kingdom of God no matter the tribulations. Of the 15 men who were arrested, sent to prison, and released, all eventually returned to their wives to live in polygamy. With high birth rates among polygamists, the population continued to swell at an astounding rate, and the kettle was still boiling. And that is the end of chapters one and two. Um, We're being informed. I'm not mad at it. She's taken us from the beginning, it looks like, to we're probably going to go up to, to her and stories and all those other things. I'm really excited about this book, and I hope you guys are too. Let me know your thoughts of what we've read so far down below. Please like the video. It does help the channel. Comment if you have something you want to talk about, and subscribe. Until next time.